Hello. How are you? Is everyone good? Everyone happy? Okay. Uh, so my name is Dan. I'm at Dan on Twitter. I like to make things that are interesting. And if you're making interesting things and you want someone to adjust your microphone for you, uh, you should come and talk to me. So I'm super happy to be here at PyCon 2015. It is 2015. It is, yes. Um, talking about R, Python, and PyPy, and languages, and interpreters, and turtles, and maybe some other things. Uh, I have 10 minutes to talk about that. Uh, but first, I have to tell you what a meta tracing JIT framework is, because that's what I really want to talk about. So R, Python is restricted Python, not R in Python. As someone pointed out earlier to me today, that's a really easy mistake to make. Don't make that. Um, so we have a restricted form of Python, and we're going to use it to make an interpreter for a language, and then we're going to do some magical things with it. Uh, so I need a little bit of time to tell you about that, and then, but before I can do that, I have to tell you what a tracing JIT is, uh, because we're going to make one of those, and then before I can do that, I have to tell you what a just-in-time compiler is, and then I have to tell you about uh, a compiler, and then I have to tell you about an interpreter. So that's a lot to get through, and I've got a demo. So hopefully that all adds up to about 10 minutes, which is how long I have to talk to, uh, except it doesn't, <laughs> not even close. Okay, so this is an interpreter uh, for a language that will henceforth be known as brain fudge. Uh, <laughs> you may recognize the language and have heard it called something else, but that's its name from now on. Okay, so an interpreter is really, it can be a really small, simple thing. This is literally the entire thing, right? This is the wall loop of the interpreter, and it calls out to a couple of functions, and those take another page or two of code. It's tiny, right? So interpreters are really easy to write, and we like writing interpreters for new languages because we can get into it immediately. But there's a problem uh, that we'll see in a minute. Okay, so here's our, our language. We have some code in the language, and then we're going to translate that into an AST, which is like a tree shape that represents the tree structure of our language. And then we're going to translate that into bytecode, which is just a long serialized uh, list of operations that we want to perform. And with certain languages, like BrainFudge, we can skip the AST part and just go straight from the language to the bytecode with a really trivial parser. Okay. So then we're going to take that bytecode and we're going to feed it into a machine. And that machine is going to pick out one particular operation that it's interested in. And it's going to go through this while loop or a, a big uh, switch statement or a bunch of ifs or something, right? And it will say, is this operation uh, plus? No. Okay. Is this operation uh, bracket? No. Okay. Is this operation this? And then finally it finds the operation that it wants and it calls a function. And then that function goes and does some things potentially in the real world, right? So it'll hit your data, uh, your, your disk or take input from your keyboard or talk to your monitor. Can you all see this okay? Good? Okay. Uh, how many of you know about this process of interpreters already? Good, like half the room, that's great. Uh, what kind of, <laughs> so, uh, so we have this bytecode feeding into this machine. What does that bytecode look like? What kind of animal does that bytecode look like? It looks like a snake, yes. What kind of snake? <laughs> well, we're at a Python convention, so it looks like a Python. But <laughs> what kind of Python? That's the next question. I was going for a sand Python. I don't know if I made it or not. OK. So then that raises another question, which is, what does this machinery uh, look like? It's a snake. And clearly, snakes like to eat apples. So our interpreter is an apple. I know. It doesn't make any sense. I'm somehow conflating worms and snakes. I, it was really late when I was drawing these. <laughs> and then the next morning, my two-year-old decided to decorate it for me. So <laughs> that, that's pretty much where we're at. Uh, right, so, so this is great, actually. Not that one, but this one. The other one's great, too. Uh, this is great because now we've written this tiny little piece of code, our interpreter, and we've made our language work. And this is amazing. There's just one problem. What's the problem? Anyone guess? Performance. Performance is the problem. Everything else works great. We've, we've got our language. It's implemented. Implementing languages is lots of fun. But it's really slow. It's like probably five or six orders of magnitude slower than we would like it to be. So how do we make it fast? Not just so we can use it in production, so, but so we can actually test it uh, by writing large programs and running them with it. 
So uh, one reason it's slow is that we're going through this loop all the time and we're not doing any optimization. But the other reason it's slow is that we've written this in some other language. So this isn't actually the full picture. The full picture looks more like this. We have some other language and we have an interpreter for our language inside of that language, right? And so we've got some type of, I don't know, xenomorph or something. Uh, so what we would like to do if we've written on our, our interpreter in a, in a language where we can compile it, and compiling gives us benefits because it's a static language, so we can analyze it and do a lot of optimizations on the compiling, is to compile this. And so our compiler is a little bit like a peeler. It takes off that outer layer of Apple, and we're left with just our interpreter running in machine code. So it's still not optimizing our programs, right? Not optimizing our programs at all, but our interpreter is running faster. This is a really important point. So now we have a faster running interpreter, which is great, but our programs in our language aren't optimized. And plus, we're writing this in Python, so uh, we don't get a lot of benefit out of compiling it to begin with because it's too dynamic of a language. So what do we do? Uh, well, we can use something called a tracing JIT to try to speed up our interpreter in a dynamic language like Python that gives us lots of nice things like garbage collection that we don't have to write ourselves. Everyone good so far? Okay, so a tracing JIT is going to look for a loop in our code, and when it finds a loop, it's going to convert that to a list of operations, and then we're going to convert that to a list of machine code. So we'll take our list of operations that we found that represent everything we did during a loop, and then we optimize that and get optimized machine code out of it. So that looks a little bit like this. We take our jitting, our just-in-time compiler, and apply it to our snake in a snake, and we get back out. We get back out <laughs> two pictures of the same thing. Uh, we get back out something that looks like this. Uh, but importantly, uh, you know whether we're running this on PyPy or LuigJet or any of these nice dynamic runtimes that have tracing jits, uh, we still have our interpreter in the host language, and then our interpreter is also in the machine code, right? Uh, right, does anyone know what mathematicians call this particular arrow that goes from one type of thing to a similar type of thing? Oh dear. Did someone say morphism? <laughs> right, so this is a morphism, and in particular this is a, uh, the technical term for this is a smorphism because it goes from snakes to snakes. So it's an endomorphism in the category of snakes. That was just for you, Ben, sorry. Okay, uh, so we can also do this another way, right? So we've covered two ways so far, or three ways, I guess. We can write an interpreter and run it in an interpreted language. We can compile it. We can run it on a runtime that has a tracing JIT. But we can also use this thing called staged metaprogramming, which is really cool. Uh, so in, for example, something like MetaOCaml, uh, we can decorate our interpreter a little bit. Uh, we could, in something like uh, lightweight modular staging in Scala, we would decorate the types a little bit. And then from these decorations, we kind of, at runtime, melt the interpreter away and get this really nice uh, kind of optimized thing. The problem is these systems aren't really optimized for language development, their general purpose. And so they don't really optimize our interpreter in the way that we would like. They're better because they melt away the cost of that wall loop and the cost of that switch statement, but they're not great. Okay, so uh, that brings us to the R Python translation tool chain, which is this really cool factory that we put our interpreter into, and it gives us back, do you know what it gives us back? Maybe you know already. It gives us back a compiler, in particular a just-in-time compiler, that we can use to go from our language, in this case a snake language, to machine code. And this is really, really cool. OK. Uh, and there's a little guy telling us how cool it is. OK. One minute. All right, so there's this quote from Lawrence Trout where he says, this completely changes the dynamics of making a dynamic language, uh, which is pretty awesome. And um, then I want to show you a really fast demo. I had a more complicated demo. That's a teaser for the next talk, which is going to be really good. OK, uh, here's the demo. So here's a language, and um, I was going to show you both this JavaScript version and the RPython version, but I only have 30 seconds, so I'll just show you this. We write some words, 
and then we hit go, and then things happen on the screen. Yay! You can't see my... Oh, dang. Is this going to work? Oh, no. And it's so big. Oh. What's that? Double click and it will get small? I don't think it works that way. Okay, so anyway, uh, the point, I guess, is that we have... <laughs> uh, okay, so I have to stop, but um, I, I wanted to show you a language for uh, making quantum snakes. So I wrote a language that would play snake for me, and then I wrote other programs, and then it's multiplayer snake. And I'll just close by reading one of the programs to hope to convince you that writing your own programming language is a really fun thing to do. Here's the program. Amble, ramble, flamber, flip, and feek or flam, and reek or ram, and leak or flamber, flam, do. And if you write your own programming languages, then you can write programs that sound like that and drive quantum snakes. Okay, thank you.